Good morning, Lifeway Church. If we haven't met, my name is Juliana, and I will be leading this morning's worship. Um, this morning, we're going to enter into a time of worship throughout our acoustic set this morning. So a little special edition. <laughs> um, if you are able, um, let us stand, come forward, and thank God for who he is and for what he's doing in our lives. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is unknown your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord There's nothing worth more and that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living God. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves and my heart becomes free and my shame is unknown in your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly
So I wanted to read a little something. Um, it's Proverbs um, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So um, what this really means to me, at least, is entrusting um, our lives, our paths, our plans, and our future in His hands. Um, surrendering all of our fear, our doubt, and anxiety, and whatever it may be that's on our mind right now. Um, but in this act of true surrender, we find peace and freedom in Christ and an everlasting peace. So this morning, as we sing our next song, um, I Surrender, let us proclaim it um, to our Lord and Savior. Jesus, I surrender all to Him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. And I surrender.
sin runs deep, your grace is more, your grace is found, is where you are, and where you Yes, Lord, we need you every second, every hour, every day. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. That's how much you loved us, Lord. That's how much you love us, Lord, that you would give us your one and only son. You would give him up for us. And Lord, this weekend, we remember those who paid the ultimate price for our freedom in this country, God. We pray and we thank you, Lord, for those men and women who paid the ultimate price. Your word says that no greater love has anyone than this, that they lay down their life for another, for their friend. God, we just thank you, Lord. And we pray for the family members and the friends and those who are left behind. Those who have lost someone who laid their lives down. We could never, ever give enough gratitude or thanks for the ultimate sacrifice that they paid. But Lord, we are so thankful. We are thankful to live in a country where we can worship, where we can praise, where we can read your word. We are thankful to live in a country where we can gather, God. There are places where people cannot do that, where they will be in prison, they would be killed, they would be tormented and tortured. So God, thank you. Thank you for those men and those women who laid their lives down. And let it always be a reminder of the ultimate sacrifice of our Savior who laid his lives down for us, his life down for us. Let us not take for granted Jesus' sacrifice. 
Let us honor him and glorify him. Let us surrender our lives onto him the way he surrendered his life for us. And let us not take for granted the freedoms that we have in this country. Let us read our word. Let us worship in public. Let us pray in public. Let us share the gospel. Because men and women died for us to be free to do so. So God, we thank you. We thank you for freedom. And we thank you that Jesus Christ gave us the ultimate freedom in him. So God, we give you the glory and the honor for Jesus and for what he did for us. And we thank you for the men and women who paid the price and for their families and their friends. We say thank you. Thank you for sharing your loved ones, for allowing them to fight for us. We thank you for your sacrifice. And God, we just thank you for Pastor Christine. We ask that you bless her as she brings today's word forth. Let it fall on good soil and not be stolen by the enemy. Let us receive what you have for us today with open ears, open hearts, open minds, open eyes. We thank you, Yeshua, for freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you would like, say hi to a friend, fist bump, and you can take a seat. Well, good morning, Lifeway. I said good morning, Lifeway. There we are. <laughs> if we haven't met, uh, my name is Pastor Matt. I'm the Life Group's pastor here. Um, and I'm just so thankful that we're able to be here this morning. Right? I mean, as Yvette just prayed, we live in a free nation, and we are free because of so many men and women who have laid their lives down. And I am so thankful for that. And we do remember them today. Um, if you're new here, I got I to gotta have my notes, you know. If you're new here, uh, what, I invite you to please text the word VIP to 860-560-19, excuse me, <laughs> 1950. Uh, and uh, we want to just welcome you and give you a little gift. Um, if you're here in the building, you can go up to guest services and see our lovely hostess with the mostest. No, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing you out. You can go see Christy or my lovely wife, Stacy when she gets here, uh, um, and they'll be happy to welcome you. Um, beyond that, if you would like to contribute, because we have the amazing opportunity to serve so many people, but we're only able to do that through your faithful tithes and offerings. If you want to give to Lifeway Church, I invite you to give. Um, there's multiple different ways you can do that. You can give at one of our giving boxes at our exits. You can scan the QR code at the giving box, and you can do it online, or you can text GIVE to 860-560-1950. Or you can mail by check, just make it out to Lifeway Church at 2172 Berlin Turnpike, Newington, Connecticut. And we really appreciate any financial support that you can give. Um, like I say, we have the opportunity to serve so many people, and we love that, but we can't do it without the financial giving that you guys provide. Um, and then lastly... Before I turn it over, I want to make a special little plug for life groups. We still have our life group table. Life groups are just about to start next week. We're actually kicking off the life group semester, summer semester, with a bike blessing and a bike ride right after second service next week. So invite any of your friends or family that have a bike, and we're going to bless, bless them as they commence their riding season, and then they're going to go for a quick ride. Um, but please feel free to join that group, or there's other groups like Steps to Freedom. Um, if you want to know what it really means to be free and not just live in a free nation, go and join Steps to Freedom. You will find what it really means to be free in Christ. Um, and then there's also Financial Peace University, which is another great resource. It helps you to be financially dependent on yourself, and, and it gives you the resources to get out of debt, 
Um, and you don't, don't worry, you don't have to open up your books and share it with everybody, you know, what your debt to income ratio is or anything like that, but it gives you the tools to pay off your debt. Um, and that's all things that you can sign up for by a couple different ways. One, you can scan the QR code right here on the back of your um, uh, worship guide. Thank you. Um, you can scan that QR code and follow the prompts there, or you can text groups to 860-560-1950. Or you can go on up to the the lobby and our wonderful hub leaders, myself, some of our facilitators will be more than happy to help you guys sign up for one of the groups. It doesn't matter. Life is better together, right? That's what we truly believe here. And life groups just helps you find the group that you belong to to help form relationships to do life together. And with that, I want to invite Pastor Christine up this morning. She brings the word. Let's welcome her. Come on, Lifeway. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Good morning, everyone. If we haven't met, my name is Christine, and I have the incredible privilege of serving as the executive pastor here at Lifeway. You know, um, you probably have noticed something very obvious. We are missing a very important part of our team, our fearless lead pastor and, and our worship leader, um, Tina. They are just away this weekend. It's their anniversary. So they, yeah, <laughs> you gave them the weekend off. They went away for, their, but they are going to be back next week. So listen, if this is your first time here today at Life, I, I just want to let you know, this is a little bit of a different experience than you would normally see. I don't know. I preach every six weeks, but I'd love for you to hear our lead pastor, Pastor Steve Preach. And actually, this is for everyone. He's going to be kicking off a brand new series next week. It's called This Is What We Do. And I figured I'm going to give you a little sneak peek, so I brought along a little clip. So if our EV team would play that, I'd appreciate it. good, right? We got to come next week to find out what this is. <laughs> so we'll kick that off next week. Now, I know Matt plugged this already, but by show of hands, who signed up for a life group today? Like, did anybody go today? Well, who signed up for a life group in general? Anybody signed up? So a lot of you have signed up. You know, I love life groups. I actually, I join groups that I don't facilitate. Like, I'm a member of some groups, and I absolutely love them. And I have facilitated groups in the past. In fact, last semester, I led a group um, about the book of Galatians. And so for 12 weeks, we dug in to a six-chapter book of Galatians. That means we had two weeks to study each chapter, which meant we were able to really dig in. We were able to talk about who is the author, who was the, what was the context of the original audience, who, who is he talking to? And then we had the fun of discovering what was, how does it apply for us today? And what's so cool about a life group, especially a Bible study, is that it's a safe place it's a safe place where there are no dumb questions, right? There are no dumb thoughts. We're able to work through things together. And whether you are a seeker and you haven't made a decision for Christ, or whether you're a devout Christian or even a pastor or leader, the truth is, is we don't all have all of the, we don't have all of the answers. Only God does. So it's so beautiful when we all come together and we seek the truth of the Father. You know, I often thought about what God was what God was doing when he'd see us all gathering together, studying his word. And I always pictured him have a giant, big smile on his face to see his creation, really wanting to get to know him, to get to know him better. God wants his people to seek him out in his word, and what better way to do it than together in a community. So 
I'm going to make another shameless plug for the life groups. Listen, if you haven't signed up, I would encourage you. I would encourage you to seek out any of them. But, like, I'm going to plug the Bible studies today. There's a bunch of really good Bible studies. There is a class called Foundations. It's led by our, I, I think, I don't know if it's called the pastoral teaching team, but I believe everyone on the team has some formal Bible training. It's awesome. And what it does is it says, what is the foundation of our faith? We talk about things like, what is baptism? Why are we called? to get baptized? What is communion about? Who is the Holy Spirit? So things that if you've ever wanted to really understand and again have a safe place where you can ask those questions, that would be an awesome one to sign up. Now Pastor Matt gave you all the ways to sign up, but I'm going to give you the easy button. If you go out to the lobby today, today's your last chance to have somebody sign you up for you. Like they'll do all of the work. They have tablets there. They will sign you up and we have physical catalogs too so you can take a look and see what we have to offer. Well, today, now that we've plugged life groups enough, um, we're going to be spending our time in Galatians today. I figured that our 12-week Bible study that we had, you guys are going to benefit from it today. So we're going to be spending some time in the first chapter of Galatians, uh, verses 6 through 10. But before we read that, which we will, I figured I'd give you just a little bit of background of what's going on in this text. Now, it's written by the Apostle Paul. Now, we call it the Book of Galatians, but it's a letter. It's a letter from the Apostle Paul to the churches that he established in the region of Galatia. Now, we're not going to get into, there's some theories of when it was written. There's a northern and southern theory. We're not going to get into that. But if you ever want to talk about it in some off time, it's something I love to nerd out about. Uh, (laughs) But this letter was likely written right after Paul and Barnabas had established the churches in the area of Galatians. And it was likely written, like, not a short time after. So after Paul and Barnabas had been there, they poured their lives into establishing these churches, right? They taught them all about the gospel. They they taught them how to lead this church when they would move on. And so... Word has now gotten back to Paul that, um, that certain Jewish teachers were questioning the apostolic authority of Paul for the purposes of being able to twist the good news of the gospel. You see, these teachers were adding requirements to the gospel. They were imposing on Gentile believers some restrictions and requirements of the law, and very specifically circumcision. They were saying in order for Gentile believers to be fully expect, accepted in the kingdom of God, that they needed the Messiah, they needed Jesus, and they needed circumcision. So, Paul is devastated. And you can hear his passion and his, and his tone in this letter His response is that this type of teaching, this betrayal of the truth of the gospel is no gospel at all. So now we're going to read Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. You always want to pay attention when you hear something twice in a row, right? Verse 10. And now, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay. So what Paul is saying here is that the the perversion of the gospel is a different gospel than what he taught him. In fact, he's saying it's not a gospel at all. It's, It's actually a counterfeit. So why is that important? Why is that such a big deal? Well, counterfeit teaching is a lot like counterfeit money. Right? It lacks authority. Think about counterfeit money. It lacks the authority of the federal government. Right? So a really good counterfeiter may be able to do people into taking their copycat work. Right? They may take it and exchange it for services. But eventually, that fake money makes it to the authorities, and it will be eventually found to be false and sentenced to destruction. The same, thing is, the same thing is true with false teaching. It lacks something very important. It lacks the authority of Christ. You know, the preacher of a false gospel, 
may believe it themselves. They may even persuade many to believe it as well, but in the end, in the final analysis, there is no salvation in a false gospel. Did you know that the word gospel literally means good message or good news? That's what gospel means. It means good news. But Paul is saying the perversion of God's word is not good news at all. In fact, it's bad news, and that's what our big idea is today. Don't let the good news become bad news. Don't let the good news become bad news. You know, you can tell in Paul's choice of words here that there was an expectation on his new converts to stand firm on the teaching that he had, that he had given them. And it's the same for us today. We have a responsibility to protect the good news. So how do we do that? How do we protect the good news? How do we prevent the good news from becoming bad news? Well, the first step in your next villain is embrace the true gospel. Embrace the true gospel. We're going to read verse 6 and 7 in our main script again because I want you to listen to something here. Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Paul's not only frustrated with the people that are, that are causing confusion, right? He's frustrated with his new converts. He's actually addressing them. He's talking directly to his new converts. After all, they're not just innocent victims to bad teaching, right? They have a responsibility to tell the difference between authentic gospel and a counterfeit. You and I, we have that same responsibility. You know, when I, got, most of you know I have five kiddos, right? When I, um, oh, I see some shrugging. I have five kids. <laughs> when my oldest was, when I was, <laughs> when, my, uh, when my oldest, when I was pregnant with him, the biggest thing on my, the biggest fear I had about, about having a brand new baby is I swore that he was going to be exchanged at birth. I was so scared that in the hustle and bustle of the labor and delivery room that my baby would be switched out for another baby. And actually, I call my mom to run this by, I run a lot of my sermons by my mom. Um, and she remembers this. She remembers. I used to watch documentaries of how kids were switched at birth and then the agonizing pain that they went through to switch them back. Okay, so... He, my son is 27 years old. 27 years ago, the baby didn't stay with mama right away, right? Like, you would have them for a couple of minutes, and then they would whisk them away to the nursery and do everything that they had to do, weigh him, clean him up, whatever. And then they may bring him back to you in a couple hours. And they didn't even stay with you overnight, right? They went back to the nursery. So I was scared to death that my son was going to be switched out. So I hatched, well, I hatched a plan. I had this strategy. I said, you know what? I'm going to hold him as long as they let me, and I'm going to study him from head to toe. And I remember the day they put him on my chest, I pulled down whatever blanket they had on him, and I started to look at him from his head. I'm like, I'm going to count his hairs. Well, this kid was the hairiest kid on the planet, right? So, okay, I wasn't going to count his hair, but I started to look at his eyes and how they slanted, and his nose, his little nose, and the curves of his face and his arms and his feet. I was convinced that I was going to study him so hard that I could pick my newborn baby out of a lineup of a thousand baby boys. That was my strategy. You see, I knew the only way to be sure that the baby that was brought back to me after he went to the nursery for care was to study him carefully. I knew that if I was well acquainted with every curve of his body, that I would instantly be able to detect a counterfeit Logan Crowley. <laughs> so that was my strategy. Well, the same is true for us with the gospel, right? The most effective way to identify a counterfeit is to study the authentic, right? In order to prevent the good news from becoming bad news, we need to be intimately familiar with the gospel. So let me ask you, what is the good news? What is the gospel? Where does it start and where does it stop? I looked up a, um, I lo I looked up a study the other day. In 2020, Cultural Research Center at Arizona uh, Christian University conducted a survey. And they found that 52% of Americans who identified as Christian didn't believe or were, couldn't I couldn't pick out the true gospel. They weren't able to identify the true gospel message. 52% of Christians. So I conducted not a statistically significant. I asked some people from this church, some friends, one of my kids, and I'll tell you that in a minute. I asked them in a couple of words, a couple of sentences, to find what is the gospel? What is the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. And I have to tell you, most people, it took a few minutes. They had to think through it. Some needed a little bit of prompting. And honestly, some people started to state some of the benefits of being in a church. Their newfound relationships, the worship, the music, right? They started to name some benefits of the church. My daughter, I called her last, I'm just going to brag on my daughter, I called my daughter yesterday, and she was not originally going to be in this, but I said, hey, Alexa, in two sentences, what's the gospel of Jesus Christ? My daughter nailed it. I was so excited. Um, But in 1 Peter 3.15, it tells us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We are supposed to be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. And I think my scripture is, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Our hope is not in our amazing worship. Our worship is amazing. (laughs) It's not in tight relationships that have been developed. It's not even in any of our church programs. There's no salvation in these things alone. You can learn about the gospel here, right? But there's no salvation in these things alone, only in Jesus So we need to be prepared to give an answer grounded in truth. So not only can we guard against false teaching, but also when we go and make disciples, we aren't making making disciples of a false teaching. So what is the gospel? Where does it start? Where does it stop? And so I hope you don't mind what I did in your worship guide. And I prayed about this a lot, and I did a lot of research I put together a pretty concise two-sentence definition of the gospel, and you're going to see there's a whole host of scriptures after. Now, this is not to replace the work that I want you to do, right? We need to be studying this. But I thought this would be helpful for the rest of our discussion. So in two sentences, and I just, not only do I pray over it and run it through scripture, I've also run it through some pastors that are much more experienced than me, and they agreed with it too. And again, I'm giving you scriptures to back it, so let me read it to you. The gospel is the good news that spiritual salvation, now spiritual salvation means deliverance from sin and its consequences. So the gospel is the good news that spiritual salvation, freedom, and forgiveness are possible only because of God's gracious gift through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. It is a gift that is available to anyone, any ethnicity, any gender, any background, who puts their faith in and yields their life to Christ. Amen. So, I'm going to read a couple of these scriptures. I'm going to be scripture heavy today. This is a good thing. Galatians um, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. So this is in the same letter that we're talking about. Paul says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans 1, 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to, to who? Everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then to the Gentile. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. This is how God showed his love among us. Among us, He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This love, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sin. There's a common denominator in here. Actually, there's two common characters in here. There's a giver and there's a receiver. Who is always the giver? God right? We are always the receiver. And that's really important. We are saved by his grace, right? The gospel is because of everything he did. Exactly, we don't deserve it. But he loves us anyways, and he makes it available to anyone. So once we're well acquainted with the authentic gospel, the next step to preventing good news from becoming bad news is we need to reject false teaching, and that's your next fill-in. Reject false teaching. Verse 8, and I think it's, oh, verse 8 and 9 says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. 
As we have already said, so I'll say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one, uh, other than what we, you accepted, then let them be under God's curse. He said it twice. This is serious. The twisting of the gospel message is a serious offense to God. What these false teachers, they were, they were also known in Galatians, these uh, Jewish false teachers were called Judaizers, so you may hear me interchange that term. What they were doing is they were adding to the gospel requirements for Gentile believers. Now, the Judaizers' problem wasn't that they thought that the Gentiles couldn't join the people of God, but rather that they couldn't conceive of Gentiles having an equal status with Jewish believers without adopting the Mosaic law, meaning the law that was given to the Jews, including circumcision. So they perpetuated old divisions, giving uncircumcised Gentile believers a lower status than the circumcised. They put a barrier in front of the Gentiles. Now, this is not in your worship guide. I added this scripture a little bit late, but you can write it down. Galatians 3.10. This is really important. This is what Paul says. He says, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. Guys, this is why Jesus came. He came because no one can do everything. We can't successfully do everything in the book of the law, right? We're sinners. We're all sinners, and we all fall short. The law was never meant to be our salvation. It was just meant to make us conscious of our sin, right? It was, made, it was, it was meant to make us aware of our need for a Savior. So these false teachers and these false teachers took the gospel of grace, the good news that was designed by, that was funded and fully implemented by the power and the grace of the almighty God, they turned it into a gospel of works where one can earn their salvation by following the letter of the law. Can't earn it, that's right. Paul says that this is no gospel at all, and he's right. If salvation could be earned under the law by observing Torah, then Jesus died for absolutely nothing. We didn't need him. That's why Paul is so passionate here. Paul says that anyone who preaches a false gospel like these Judaizers will be cursed. And actually, I'm going to have you bring up the uh, verse 8. I think it's verse 8. It says, but even if we, we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach you, let them be under God's curse. That word curse in Greek is anathema, and it means doomed for destruction, eternally condemned. Paul's exhibiting what I would call justified anger towards those who twist the truth truth of the original gospel. Now, some of his, some people who were against Paul said that, you know, he was just upset that they were questioning his authority, but honestly, he was exhibiting the same attitude towards false teaching as Jesus did when he walked the earth. Actually, in Matthew 23, Jesus confronts teachers of the law and Pharisees who rejected part of the re- revealed word of God, and instead, they replaced it with their own ideas and their own interpretations. And this is how Jesus handled it in Matthew 23:13. He said, "What sorrows awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites?" You, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others in either. Jesus' attitude should be paid attention to here, right? He's not being tolerant or passive or accommodating as somebody who is fearful that they're going to offend. No, he's angry, and he's quick to denounce corruption, even in very high places. <clears throat> Because Jesus knew that the distortion of God's word was causing harm to the people. And why Jesus is angry, and you can hear it in his tone, you can also hear his compassion for those that are being kept out of the kingdom of God. This is the same exact attitude that Paul is exhibiting here. Ultimately, when the good news is distorted, it becomes bad news, and it causes harm. So the demand for circumcision on the Gentile believers was an obstacle that the Judaizers were putting in the path of the Gentiles and the kingdom of heaven. Now, we don't, we don't really have this issue of circumcision, right? We don't have people coming into the church telling you that you can earn your salvation through circumcision, right? But what we do contend with in the modern day church is false teaching available beyond just wrong ideas coming into the four walls of the church. We have the internet, 
we have social media. We are inundated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have teachers on the internet that have no accountability to the local church. And there are a lot of ideas on the internet, on social media, about who Jesus is and what his life, death, and resurrection means to the world. I actually thought a lot. I was like, I'm going to provide a list of all the false teaching. I'm going to provide a list of false teachers, but that's not the right thing to do. You know, I don't want to give you a list, but I want to prepare you to be able to tell the difference. And when you find it, we've got to figure out what we're going to do with it, right? So we're going to have a little bit of an interactive part of our message today. We are going to, I'm going to say a couple of statements, and we're going to, we're going to decide whether or not it's true gospel. Is this the truth or is it false? So just, I'm going to say a statement. It doesn't mean I believe it. I'm saying it. But we're going to say true or false. We're going to see if we can tell the difference. Here we go. You ready? If you're online, you can participate too. You can say true or false. You must be water baptized to enter the kingdom of heaven. True or false? Let's do thumbs up, thumbs down. Is that true or false? Oh, you guys got it right. It is false. Baptism is something that God commands us to do in obedience as believers, right? Even if you think about the thief on the cross with Jesus, right? He, he admitted to his sin. He admitted that he deserved to be up on the cross, meaning he was probably a thief right up to the time that he died, but he turned to Jesus, and what Jesus said to him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't get water baptized, right? So there's one. Now, there's many things that Jesus instructs us to do as his followers, and we ought to do them. For example, here's another example. Jesus instructs us to pray continually. Does that mean that is true? But does that mean one time a day gets us into heaven? Twice a day gets us into heaven? Three times a day, what gets us into heaven? Yeah. Right? We have to remember that the true gospel, while it's very much for us and it's very much for our benefit, it is not about us and what we can do for ourselves. Right? It's all about what God does for us. I'm going to give you another example. This one's a little bit touchy, but we're going to talk about this one for a little bit because I think there's a lot of value here. Because if we're going to identify false teaching, we better make sure it's false teaching. We don't want to be running around calling people heretics and false teachers. So here's a statement. I'm going to say it. You need to have a King James Bible to know the true Jesus, meaning it's Jesus plus King James Bible. False or true? Okay. We're going to talk about this for a minute. Is it okay to have a preference for a King James Bible? Yes, it is. There are people who passionately debate of why it's a superior version. Listen, my parents are one of them. We actually have had a lot of really good debates, and there are a lot of things actually in the church that we could debate about, right? It's okay to have a preference. It's absolutely okay. I love the King James Bible. I love to memorize it, but we can't make it a stumbling block. Right? And I think it's important that we think through the things we hear. Is this a preference? Preferences is okay. Yes. So there are a lot of things in the church that we can debate about. So baptism, full submersion or sprinkling. Now you may have a very strong opinion, but there's going to be people in heaven who were sprinkled baptized, and there's going to be people who weren't baptized, and people who are full submersion, just like there's going to be people who read the NIV, the NLT version, the King James version, right? We have to be careful that when a preference or a gray area that's outside, I'm going to give you an idea of a gray, I'm going to say it, it involves me a little bit. Here's a gray area, right? There are people that believe through the scriptures that women shouldn't be pastors. And there are people that believe that that was taken out of context and they should be pastors. There are going to be people in heaven who believe that women should be pastors and there's going to be people in heaven who didn't, right? It's not foundational to our faith. Our faith. When a preference or a gray area that's outside of the gospel that we just reviewed becomes a rule for salvation... It's false teaching. Does that make sense? Awesome. So we have a responsibility to identify and reject false teaching, but we have to be careful to tell the difference between corruption of God's word or a preference or even a gray area. 
When we identify false teaching, though, that is a stumbling block that shuts the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. That's when we need to inherit Jesus and Paul's justified anger. And we need to confront and reject the perversion of God's word, even if it doesn't make us popular. And this is the next step. The next step uh, to prevent good news from becoming bad news is to seek to please God and not man. Seek to please God and not man. Okay, verse 10 in our main scripture today, it says, now this is Paul speaking, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And he's right, he wouldn't be a servant of Christ, he'd be a servant of the people. You know, I think one of the best ways that we can prevent good news from becoming bad news is, is um, setting our eyes on the Lord. And all that we say and all that we do, we seek to please him. And we stop looking for the approval of everyone around us. See, the fact is, is that we can't effectively influence others to follow Christ if we're more concerned what people think about us than what God desires. For identification with Christ and his good news is shameful to us, then it, compromising truth becomes easy, right? In fact, sometimes we add to the gospel because we think we need to dress it up a bit. We need to make it a little bit more attractive to people. We maybe say things like, put your faith in Jesus and your life will be so much easier. I love you guys. <laughs> put your faith in Jesus and you'll be healthier. Your kids are going to obey you every day of their lives. Your relationships are going to be amazing. Actually, there's preachers that will tell you that God wants you to be rich and wealthy. No, Jesus said that we would have trouble. That's not part of the gospel. 1 Timothy 4.3 says, For there will be a time, for, there, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Paul says, for a time will come. Well, I'm telling you, the time has come. The time is here. Sound doctrine is not popular. Corruption of God's word is happening all day, every day. It's probably happening right now in every country, in every language. But the solution is really simple. It's truth. It's the true gospel of grace. Jesus is the answer to corruption. He's the answer to evil. He's the answer to confusion, to loneliness, to lies. The gospel is the antidote to sin and to death. The gospel is simple and clear. And it's the responsibility of every believer, every follower of Christ, to stand in its defense. And that's our call to action today. Commit to stand in defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Commit to stand in defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think I gave you two fill-ins. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> 2 Timothy 1.14 says this, For the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. And Jesus commanded his followers, that's, that's you and me who put our faith in him, to go and make disciples. We were entrusted as the carriers, the preachers, and the, de and the defenders of the true gospel. This is a tall task, right? But the good news is, is God didn't ask us to do it in our own strength. He's given us the Holy Spirit, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can stand firm on truth. So in a minute, we're going to close in prayer. And our prayer is going to be in two parts today. The first part of our prayer is for, for believers, for believers who have put their faith in Jesus. And the second part is for seekers. So if you haven't made a decision, I'll be talking to you in a minute. But if you're a believer... And you're ready to commit to stand in defense of the gospel. We're going to do that together in our prayer today. And if you're a seeker and you haven't made a decision for Christ in a few minutes, 
I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that, to put your faith in him. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for your incredible love for us. Your word tells us that why we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. God, in your infinite love for us, you provided an escape from sin and from death and from shame. This gift of freedom and forgiveness is, a, is precious, and its truth has been entrusted to each one of us to guard. So, Father, we come to you today as your people. We commit to stand for truth. God, by the power of your Holy Spirit that lives within us, we commit to stand in defense of the gospel of grace. Father, help us to embrace truth. Help us to reject false teaching so that those that are far from you will hear the truth, will hear the good news, and they will turn to you. Father, help us to be faithful carriers and proclaimers of the gospel so that the kingdom of heaven will be packed full. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And while we're still in this atmosphere of prayer, I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed because I want to talk to those of you that may not know where you stand with God right now. Maybe you thought you had to earn your way in with God. Maybe you thought you had to get right before you could come to the Father. But the truth is, none of us are, we're no match for sin. Not one of us. Scripture tells us that we're all sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. It also tells us that the just punishment for our sin is death. Now well, that doesn't sound like good news, but the good news is, is that God loves us so much he stepped in to pay that penalty that we each owe. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay the debt for my sin, for your sin, for the world. Now Jesus lived a sinless life, and though he never sinned, he took punishment upon himself. His love for us, his love for you and me, led him to be nailed to a cross. His love for us compelled him to give up his life in exchange for ours. Jesus died and he rose again, and now everyone, including you, who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So today, I'm asking you, call upon the name of Jesus, and in faith, you will be saved. Listen, this is for you. This is for anybody. This is for anybody who wants to put their faith in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done in your past. This is for you. Repeat this simple prayer with me now if you want to accept Jesus. Father in heaven, I know that in my life, I've not always followed you, and I've chose to go my own way. I also know that I've sinned, and I've hurt you, and for that, I am sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus, your one and only son, died on the cross for my sins, and I'm thankful for his sacrifice. God, I'm ready to trust you as my Lord and give you leadership over my life, I ask that you guide me all of the days of my life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen, amen. Let's celebrate what God's doing here. Thank you so much, Pastor Christine, for that lovely word. If you... Um, just prayed that prayer with Pastor Christine. I want to invite you to, to stop up at guest services or text the word book to 860-560-1950. Uh, we want to give you a, a special gift. It's called the New Believer's Handbook. And it's just going to, it's a simple, short, quick read. And it's going to help you to take your next step in your faith now that you've committed your life to Christ, okay? Um, I... Uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming out this morning. And before I dismiss you, I just want to say a quick blessing over you, okay? Um, but before I do that, I want to invite our prayer team to come on up. If you guys have something to bring before the Lord, do not leave this building before you pray about it. And these people would love to pray with you, okay? So with that, may God Almighty bless you and keep you. May his face come to shine upon you and keep you safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We'll see you next week at 9.30 or 11.15.